for that great singing thank you for uh, or having the orchestra here Amen. and uh playing with us that it just always adds to uh the music and our our worship so thank you for those uh that are here with that a couple quick announcements uh remember our revival services with brent gellis and uh and also there's some sign-ups on the back table for the food sign-ups make sure you take a look at those and see what you can bring for the kate you will benefit brunch and silent auction Things are coming in quickly for that, and it's coming up soon. So please uh, get involved in, in any way you can in that way. The Ladies' Brunch is May 11th. Uh, Rachel Harrison, the wife of Pastor Todd Harrison of Bible Baptist Church. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, if you were here this morning, you'd know why I emphasize that. Uh, the other couple things that we, we've kind of forgotten to, not necessarily forgotten, but just haven't announced really well is number one, uh, this weekend, well, the end of this week, uh, Cassandra and I are going to be taking, and, and Rachel, are going to be taking uh, several uh, teens from our Christian school over to Maranatha Baptist University to check out the school there, be on the campus for a day or so, a day and a half, as well, uh, just to see some classes and, and participate there, uh, as well as uh, I'm going to I do a little bit of recruiting there as well. So be in prayer that the Lord would lead us to the right people. Uh, our, we, are in, we are in need, and uh, th this is not a surprise to the Lord, and he has the right people. And so let's go ahead and continue praying. We talked this morning about bold prayer, because bold prayer honors our God. So we're going to do that. We're going to pray that the Lord would bring to us the people that he wants to be a part of this ministry. Amen? Will you join me in that? Uh, so please do that. Uh, the, the second thing is the jogathon, and we haven't really announced it well from the pulpit. No, we apologize for that. Uh, Pastor Jordan, come on up here. Uh, I mentioned to you a week or two ago that he wanted to do something special, so I'm going to give him a chance uh, to explain what he's going to do, and then I'll explain what I'm going to do, and I'll be back. All right, so the special thing that I'm going to do for Jogathon, okay? Unlike regular, where I will just be running many, many, many laps, and you guys can uh, pay per lap or whatever it is, I'm going to be doing a flat rate, okay? It is going to be $10 for one lap. And now you might be thinking, that's a lot of money for one lap, okay? But listen, you get to customize that lap for me, okay? Whatever you tell me to do in that lap, I will do it. Okay, so I'm saying if you want me to do somersaults the whole lap, done. You want me to run backwards, done. You want me to do cartwheels, done. You want me to have a wheelbarrow with you in it, done. Okay, now there are some rules to this. First stipulation, okay, I have to physically be able to do it. Okay, so unfortunately I cannot walk on my hands, so I can't do a whole lap doing a handstand. I cannot do backflips. Okay, so I can't do a whole lap doing backflips and whatever. Um, I have the right to say, hey, I cannot do that, all right? And the second thing is, you, even uh, my, my brother-in-law, Kyle, 
said that when I was talking to him about it, that he would love for me to wear a ladybug costume. I said, you pay for it, I'll do it, okay? So if that's what you want me to do, you want me to wear a Santa Claus outfit or whatever it may be, I will do that too, but again, I get the right to veto it at a certain level, okay? I am still, I am still an assistant pastor here, okay? But either way, that is what I'm going to be doing, okay? So if you would like to sponsor me for one, dollar, for one lap, okay, one lap, $10, I will do whatever it is that you want me to do, okay? Now, that being said, I will get through every single request that I have, regardless of how many there are. I will be out there night and day, day and night, until it's finished, okay? <laughs> so whatever it is, put it uh, down, and we'll get to it. Do you want to explain yeah. how? Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Guys, can you get really creative about it with that? Uh, really, please? Because I'm going to video, like, everything that he does. Uh, so please get, get creative with that. Um, as far as for myself, uh, I am going to this year try to get back out there and do it per mile. Uh, I'll run throughout the day. I'll run in the gym. I'll run uh, with those outside, uh, out with behind the school as well. And I'm going to get as many miles in throughout the day as I can. So if you want to sponsor your pastor, uh, you can use one of these, all right? Now, it, these, these are not the typical jogathon things because we didn't want to burden you with another yellow slip, all right? Uh, and so if you are interested in um, supporting the school by supporting Pastor Jordan or myself, just use one of these. Write, if you want to write on the back of this little thing what you want Pastor Jordan to do and just put it into the... Uh, the communication box, just do that, right? You can write on there, other, you know, Pastor Dell, you know, flat rate per mile, and, uh, and then we'll let you know how many miles I ran. Just so you're aware, I think I can probably get somewhere between five and 10, all right? So if that helps you, you know, 50 cents a, a mile, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do, all right? I, I believe there was one other thing I needed to mention. I... Uh, not on here, but I will, I will mention that we need to continue praying for our missionaries, uh, Ben and Lauren Childs. This month, they're coming home, the end of this month, and uh, it is, uh, we're excited to see them. We're excited to have them around, uh, but just be in prayer. And now that I've gone through the trip from Papua New Guinea to here, we really need to pray for them, all right? So make sure that you're praying for them throughout this month as they get packed up and, and head this direction, all right? Let's go ahead and go to Lord in prayer, and then we'll continue. Oh, with our offering. We'll go straight to our offering. Uh, with Esther. Uh, is Esther here? Okay, there she is. All right, let's go ahead and uh, have the guys come on down this evening. Thank you so much for those that were with us this morning. It was a great time, uh, a great crowd, uh, and a good time praying for our young families and just our families of our church. Let's go ahead and have Brother Barrage, would you lead us in a word of prayer for our evening offerings tonight? Amen.
I love anybody that does an operatory, but when it's one of your own, it's pretty special. She's not listening to me, so she won't be embarrassed. <laughs> I also love, I, I still can't get over how fantastic that piano sounds. And you hear things over and over and over again on the kind of the hunk of junk piano you have at home. And you play it on that, and it's beautiful. That piano has been such a blessing uh, to this ministry. Next, we'll be singing hymn number 308, Nothing But the Blood.
seated. Amen. Wonderful is Jesus. Thank you for that. I just can't get over. I keep thinking about how wonderful uh, it was to be in the Lord's house this last week on Easter. I just can't, I can't get over how great it was to be with you and serving and worshiping our risen Savior. And I want to just, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for those that were a part of the kitchen. Thank you for part of, uh, any part of the service. It was just such an encouragement. Uh, and um, a challenge that we ought to serve him with that veracity, with that uh, type of professionalism, that type of excitement each and every week, uh, each and every day, really, uh, we should serve our risen Savior. Well, we are, we are in Revelation chapter 20, and some of you that have been keeping notes would say, we, we are doing a little bit of a review. Yes, we, we're still... Um, we're, we're almost back, completely back to where we had left off. Uh, th- we left off really uh, in our second week of Revelation 20, uh, going into 21. And uh, it was so long ago that I thought, you know what, this really needs to get, uh, go. Th- we need to go through this once again. The more repetition on it, the more knowledge we'll have with that. And hopefully the more knowledge, uh, the more of a heart for the things of God we will have. So, Let's go ahead and go to Lord in prayer, and then we'll, we'll dive into Revelation 20 for just a couple minutes here this evening, all right? Lord, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for another opportunity. We do not take it lightly. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to gather together, open your word, and hear from you. Lord, we want that to happen. We, we seek your face. We ask of wisdom from you. Lord, we know that you will give to all men liberally uh, the wisdom that we seek. Lord, especially if that wisdom Uh, is a desire to know more about you. Lord, I pray that we would uh, remember these things, that these things would not just be head knowledge, but that it would affect our heart for the lost. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would uh, eagerly look forward to the day uh, that you will return and rapture your church. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be uh, good stewards of the faith that we have right now, uh, that others may know and, and see our God in heaven for who he truly is and accept him for their personal Savior as well. Lord, would you bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we've made it to Revelation 20. Uh, and uh, again, this is maybe, maybe the second, maybe for one and a half uh, times through here. And uh, each time I go through it, I, I, I gain a little bit more. Uh, so we're, we're going to try to uh, pull this uh, into bite-sized pieces uh, for us tonight. 
It has been a long road to get here to Revelation 20. I know we have more to go, but it seems like kind of like a milestone that we've made it to Revelation 20. I, here's what we've gone over. We've gone over the church age. Several years ago, we started this, by the way, and we went over all of the churches uh, of Asia. Uh, what, a, what a great study that is. We started it on Wednesdays and we moved it to Sunday evenings. We've gone over the church age. We've talked about the rapture, meeting the Lord in the air, which is not the second coming. Not the second coming of Christ. Seven-year tribulation. During that, we see the Antichrist, part of the unholy trinity. Remember, God, the, the devil can only imitate the holiness of God. And so he has the trinity, but the unholy trinity. And it is merely just a fake power. The Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, and the devil. The sealed judgments, we've seen those. The, the white the red, the black, the pale, the, the martyrs, cosmic calamities. We've seen them all. We've seen uh, within that seventh uh, seal, we've seen uh, the trumpet judgments. And before that, we saw the 144,000 Jewish evangelists sealed. Uh, and what a great revival it will be on this earth. During the tribulation, as God's people, the 144,000 Jews, uh, spread the gospel to a world, a needy, needy world. We then read through the great, the great drama, and that was this bird's eye view of, of creation to the end of time. And within that drama, uh, Revelation 11 through 13, we see that uh, some of it is history, some of it is prophetic, but it is seen as it is a complete picture. God looks at time like this. He doesn't look at time like this. He sees time like a straight line. And he doesn't see it, it, it being, it, it's so complete in God's mind that he, he discusses it with John, shows, reveals it to John as if the things that were to come have, are, is so sure that it's already written. It's already done. We see the bowl or the vile judgments. And uh, the, the last three of those are the, really the wrath of God that ushers in the, the great tribulation, the, the last three and a half years. We see the, the pauses in the action, the parenthesis. We see the second coming of Christ with the saints. He comes and he does battle. We saw this uh, last couple, a couple weeks ago. We reviewed the, the battle of Armageddon. We get to come with Christ. We get to come with him, the, with the saints. Uh, we get to come with him, but we don't have to lift a spear or a sword at all. We just follow him and watch what he does. And what's he do? He destroys with his voice. The, uh, a, a, a sword sharper than a, a two-edged sword sharper than anything uh, goes from his voice uh, uh, from his mouth. And what did we say? The beginning of creation, he spoke things into existence. The power of his voice has the ability, the power to create. And at the, begin, at the end here, we see his voice has the power to destroy. We see the battle of Armageddon, and at the end of that, the, the beast and the false prophet, two parts of the, the unholy trinity, the beast, the antichrist, and the false prophet. Remember, the false prophet is the, the religious leader that points power to the antichrist during the tribulation. They are cast into the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. And then we see after that, we see the marriage supper of the Lamb. You might say, I thought the marriage supper of the Lamb would be like when we first get to heaven. We get to sit down and have a feast with our Savior. We've got to wait for all of the redeemed. And some of those souls have not yet been redeemed because the seven-year period, his, his long-suffering, his grace is still extended to humanity. And there will be uh, multitudes that accept Christ and will be martyred because of their faith in Christ. And they are the souls that cry out to God, how long will you wait to avenge our blood? And they are not in their glorified bodies yet in the tribulation. They are, uh, they are, their souls are there up in heaven. And that's why it says uh, in the fifth seal that their souls are under the throne of God. They are not in their glorified bodies such as we are, uh, the, the redeemed from the church age. And they come, we all come with Christ. Uh, to the marriage supper of the Lamb, after the battle and after the physical resurrection of all the saints. 
not just Old Testament, New Testament, church age, but of the tribulation. All tribulation saints must be resurrected in order to come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And now we get to the millennial kingdom. And this is a, a, a fun one. The millennial kingdom. One commentator says this about Revelation 20. It's a little bit lengthier, but so, so please focus as I read. He says, As we have continued in our study of the book of Revelation, we have observed how the number of fellow saints who share our understanding of the text dwindles evermore as we proceed. This is because interpreting the book of Revelation is like traveling along a series of roads from a point of origin to a destination. As with any roadway along the route, we meet with numerous folks or uh, numerous forks in the road which head off in different directions, leading to varied destinations. The fork in the road which looms before us is Revelation 20 and is the thousand year reign, the millennial kingdom. Is the thousand year reign described here that of a literal kingdom on earth? Is it of a future reign or is it already in progress? Are the two resurrections which bracket the thousand years to be understood as literal, physical raisings from the dead? Or are they spiritual resurrections related to faith? Or are they some combination of the two? When Satan is bound for the duration of this period, how complete is his binding? Who binds him and how is he bound? Is he even bound now? These are just some of the questions which confront the reader of Revelation 20. The forks in the road are many, but we're going to ask the Lord once again this evening that he would give us wisdom to stay on the road that he would have us to follow in his word. Because here, I, this is one thing I believe, I know good people that differ I, in their translation of Revelation 20. I know good people that differ, but what I want to say is God is not a God of confusion. Agree? God is not a God of confusion. He, when we open his word, he wants us to understand. And what does he tell us? Ask for wisdom. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. Now, we may differ, but we're going to leave that up to God's sovereignty, and we're going to leave that up to his will, and, uh, and we're going to be okay with it. So once again, before we get into Revelation 20, let's ask the Lord. Lord, there is so much to cover here. Lord, there's so many questions that loom in our minds. Lord, I pray that you would uh, show yourself strong, that your word would be clear to us, that you would speak through me, that we would see the clear and narrow way that you have for us to believe. Lord, I pray that uh, we would not uh, cause more confusion or more questions, but Lord, we would be uh, very clear in the way that we ought to interpret your scripture Lord, that we would leave it all up to you, that you would get the glory for all that is done and understood here. In Jesus' name, amen. There is so much to cover, so I, I want to thank you for your grace and understanding uh, with me as we attempt to know the heart of God. It is incredibly humbling to uh, look at Revelation with you. Uh, so let's begin to see how far into this chapter we're, we're going to make it tonight. So please follow with me. The earthly kingdom of God is the subject of this chapter, which makes sense because Revelation 19 verse 15 says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it sh he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. W what is, why, does that, why do I bring that verse up? Because he is physically on earth, and is, should smite the nations, and he will rule them. We're talking about a physical rule, a physical uh, kingdom on earth. So Jesus comes again in chapter 19. Praise the Lord, we see that. And defeats the armies of the world with just his word. And then he sets up the kingdom that even Matthew calls out for in his gospel. He says in Matthew 6.10, what does he say? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I want to be very honest with you tonight. I will tell you that, there, that when one truly begins to study the depth, in depth the book of Revelation, I feel that it is here that most questions arise. Thoughts can go anywhere. Hesitations begin. 
uh, and it is because man's constant need to muddy the clear word, the waters of God's word. If we would simply take the Bible for what it says and read it in context and literary style, we would save much time and headache. So we're going to attempt to do that very thing tonight. Uh, where, where lies all the problems with translation and interpretation then? Your system of interpretation will be the driving force in how you view the symbols of these passages. Before I give you, uh, before we dive really deeply into uh, the main translations, interpretations of this, this, I feel like it is a, a wise thing to go over once again what we believe in uh, and uh, I believe to be best. I hold to the view, and we uh, as a church, uh, doctrinally hold to the view that really all of our church fathers have uh, historically held to, and that is pre-millennialism. Pre-millennialism. That is the belief that Christ returns before his earthly kingdom is set up for a thousand years. We read that literally. We believe that Jesus is on earth at his second coming and sets up a thousand year reign. He returns pre millennial so let's read the verses that lead us to that clear interpretation and view. And as we do that, may we use, uh, you might remember this from months and months and months ago now, the golden rule of interpretation. Let me read you for you the golden rule of interpretation. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary usual literary meaning unless the facts of the immediate context studied in the light of related passages and, uh, and fundamental truths indicate clearly otherwise. Let me break that down for you. If it makes sense in a clear and simple way, don't muddy the water. Amen? We read the Bible in a way that we understand that God has given uh, many men, his words through their characteristics. We cannot read poetry in the same literary style as we would John's writing here in Revelation. So we interpret based on literary style. When we see things such as like as unto, we do not say, oh, he, th you know, this... Uh, you know, you can go to many passages, uh, but oh, this is obviously an exact literary, uh, you know, they have this thing, the, these wings, this, this sound from their wings, these, uh, this stinging power, whatever it may be. Maybe it's the locust and uh, one of the uh, trumpet judgments. What we believe is literal interpretation based on literary style. So, as we get into... Chapter 20, we, we must remember the golden rule of interpretation. Do not muddy the waters if it makes clear sense. Look at verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, really quickly, there is no delineation of time here between the end of chapter 19 and the beginning of chapter 20. So there is no, like, a pause is immediately into verse 20. Or I'm sorry, chapter 20. Um, this is directly related to the end of chapter 19. Verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That is the tribulation saints. Verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. And this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Look at verse 5, 
let's, let's clear this up very, very simply. When it says this is the first resurrection, it is not referring to the, the, second, or the first part of verse 5. It is actually connected in a literary style back to those in verse 4. The end of verse 5, or the beginning of verse 5, is just an, an additional thought. The rest of the dead lived not again. That's just a separate thought. All right, the, the, the rest of the dead, those, are those that were killed during Armageddon, the, the millions and millions that were killed by the, the word of God at the battle of Armageddon, they lived not again until the end of the thousand years. And then it says, this is the first resurrection, tying it to verse 4, which is the resurrection, the physical resurrection of tribulation saints before the millennial reign. An angel here, so let's, let's go back even a little bit more and talk about these first six verses. An angel, possibly Jesus, we do not know, opens the bottomless pit and grabs the dragon, that old serpent. It's callback. I love the callbacks. Where does it go back to? Genesis 3, 15, right? That, and, and that's why I believe, personally, I believe this, might, this very well could be Jesus that opens the bottomless pit. Because that's a callback to what he will do uh, back in Genesis 3.15. The angel, given power from the throne of God, binds the devil for a thousand years. This angel removes or, or sets a seal. He removes the devil's power to deceive the people living on earth at the time. Verse 3 says, after that, meaning after the thousand years, he will be loosed for a little season. John clearly tells us that this isn't the last time that we will see the devil. This will come back up, so remember this. Verse 4, who is a part of the millennial kingdom? Well, it says, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. If you go all the way back to Revelation 4 and verse 4, you don't need to do that. I'll read it for you. It says this, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Do you remember these elders that represent the church who died uh, their earthly death before the rapture. Remember uh, Revelation 2, 26, that says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. These are not just tribulation saints, but these are the, those that have died in Christ uh, throughout time. This was God's promise to those in Thyatira and Laodicea, the church age, that were faithful to him. So, it would stand to reason that the first group of those that reign with Christ during the millennial kingdom is us. We have a part in reigning in the millennial kingdom. What does that look like? Well, let me give you some of my, one of my thoughts. And again, this is my thought. I want to preface that, all right? Because this is not... This is not scripture, but I believe, I, through studying, that those of us that reign with Christ will not reign in a, in a sense of being physically walking around on earth. We're not going to be able to walk into Neiman's, all right, uh, during the millennial reign. I believe that those that are on earth in physical form are only those that make it through the tribulation. There will be a remnant, a very small few, that, that enter into the millennial reign in their physical bodies. And it's many, several of them, uh, many of them will be those that have accepted Christ as their Savior through the tribulation and were not martyred. They made it into the millennial kingdom. They are the ones that are physical on earth. I believe in my study, and again, I could change uh, on this based on uh, you know, years of uh, more wisdom, all right? But I believe that those of us and tribulation saints that are now resurrected will reign in a sense of angels now. Angels that are, we have a physical realm right now. We have, and we have a spiritual realm. We have angels that are all around us, and they, they are messengers from God to us. And, and I, what I believe is we will reign over the earth, not in a physical sense, but we will reign over the earth in a 
uh, in a glorified, almost angelic uh, being type sense. Now, you might differ on that, we, and I'd love to have a conversation with you on that. But that's where I believe, it, I believe it's one of the only ways that we can say that at the end of the millennium, uh, we, we have a large number of people that are deceived by the devil. Do you, ever, do you realize that? Have you read that? And you're like, where does this large number of people come that are deceived by the devil and try to overthrow God again? Well, they are the children of those that are in physical form on earth during the millennial reign. And they uh, have children. Those children are born into sin. However, they are born into a utopia, right? The, the devil does not uh, have anything to do with them, yet they are in sin. They, are, they have a sin nature. And when given the opportunity, those that do not accept Christ during the millennial reign, they will be deceived by the devil when he is loosed again. All right? So I believe this is one of the only ways you can uh, write it up so that there, is, there are physical bodies on earth during the millennium and we reign over in an angelic sense. Let's continue. The second group that will be there are the Old Testament saints, those who had faith in God for salvation and died prior to the gift of the Spirit. Right, the baptism of the Spirit. We we talked about that. That Jesus uh, led captivity captive, and He brought those that were saved by faith into heaven, uh, into their glorified bodies, because uh, He made that way, that uh, that atonement, that final sacrifice. Uh, and I believe the Old Testament saints will be reigning in the millennial reign. Daniel twelve one and two tells us about this group. It says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. You might say, what? Pastor, how, what does that last phrase mean? Some will, will uh, awake into everlasting life and some will uh, awake into shame and everlasting contempt. Well, that is a great question. The last part is acknowledging the second resurrection that we read here in the millennial reign. More on that in just a second. We'll look at the second resurrection. The third group that is to reign in the millennial kingdom are the tribulation saints that were martyred for their faith. We see this clearly explained to us in verse 4. Look at verse 4, Revelation 20. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark in their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So, we know... Uh, these groups, Old Testament saints, church age saints, and tribulation saints are part of what is called the first resurrection. Many questions begin here because what does John mean by the first resurrection? Very simply put, this resurrection is a group of resurrection events that transpire sequentially but are treated in a single category which is the raising to life of all those who, called the, uh, who are called the redeemed. The very si most simple way I can explain this for you tonight is this. Cooper, Kinsley, Kyla, and Cambry are all turpening children, but they were not all born at the same time. Right? Just like our Old Testament saints, they are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The very same way that you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Just like our tribulation saints, brothers and sisters, that will come one day. They are all God's children. They are all redeemed, but at different times. So when we are resurrected to Christ, it is called the first resurrection. We're all part of what's called the first resurrection, yet we don't we're not all involved in the same first resurrection. Does that make sense? Okay, I saw some head nods. Some are awake. There are several other events that are categorized as the first resurrection. It's not just Old Testament, not just the, uh, the church age and the tribulation saints. 
the first resurrection events, uh, uh, we, we would include Jesus on the third day. Remember the, the, first, uh, the first fruits? A, f- a few Old Testament saints at the earthquake during Jesus' crucifixion. The church age believers at the rapture. Two witnesses killed by the beast and raised three days later. We looked at that, the two witnesses. They would be considered in the first resurrections because they uh, have died once and now they are raised. The Old Testament saints after Jacob's trouble prior to the millennial reign. And tribulation martyrs prior to the millennial reign. The second resurrection, and this is really where we'll we'll, we'll finish up, is just the the first and the second resurrection. Because it's important to understand as as not not a Baptist, but just as a Biblicist. Somebody who understands God's word. You need to know these things. All right, the second resurrection. The second resurrection is only one event, and it is the resurrection of all the unbelieving dead. I want to say that again. I want it to soak in. The second resurrection is one event, just one, and it is the resurrection of all of the unbelieving dead. God will judge this group and find them guilty at the great white throne and cast them into the lake of fire. That is why Daniel 12, 2 says that some will be raised to shame and everlasting contempt. They are the unbelieving dead. So if they died before Christ, without Christ, without faith in Christ, if they died during the church age right now, without Christ, if they die in the tribulation without Christ, they do not raise until the great white throne judgment. There's one resurrection of the unbelieving dead altogether. So let's recap up till now. Jesus' second coming is a literal return to earth. I stress that, Christians, because a lot of people don't believe that. It is a literal return. Christ steps foot on this earth. A literal second return, a second coming to the to the earth with the church saints, tribulation saints, and Old Testament saints raised from the dead. The devil is bound for a thousand years in the pit. The marriage supper of the Lamb has taken place after the physical resurrection of all of those groups. We have to have everybody at the marriage supper. We can't have leftovers, as I've said before. Who reigns during the millennial kingdom? The same group that is a part of the first resurrection. Now, I cannot tell you how it looks specifically. I don't know how each of us, it will look for us to reign during the millennial kingdom. But I do know that church saints, Old Testament saints, and tribulation martyrs all have a role in reigning during the thousand years. And I do believe, and I hope you do as well, that this thousand years is not something that we're in right now. Right? We are not in the millennial reign. Uh, So many things have to happen before we could say we're in the millennial reign. And uh, I hope that I'm not here in the millennial reign, all right? Because of everything else we've gone over before this, I hope I'm not here for, uh, to get into the millennial reign. Uh, hopefully, I'll come with Christ uh, and not be here. Verse 5, verse 5, look at verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So let's use our common sense deduction. Remember the common sense of translation? If the first resurrection is all the redeemed from all time, then the rest of the dead. Who's that referring to? The rest of the dead. All unbelievers. All unbelievers would have to be the unbelieving dead that will be resurrected at the end of the millennial reign to be judged at the great white throne. Here's important to note. The premillennialist view, which I pray you hold to, because I believe it is the biblical sense common sense. The premillennialist view must hold these resurrections of the dead, both the first and the second, to be a literal resurrection, not spiritual. And you say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, some people right now that believe that we're in the millennial reign would say that the resurrection would be the resurrection of your soul from death to life in Christ. It's not referring to physical death. So if we're raised uh, to, uh, if we're raised to life in, this, in a spiritual sense, then we could already be through parts of the tribulation and into the millennial reign, and 
Uh, and some even go as far as saying, well, Satan's power is bound to a sense. God doesn't allow him to do anything he wants, so Satan is even bound right now. And we are to reign. I talked with a lady just a while ago about this, that we are to reign, we are to battle, the, even the, the, uh, uh, the bound Satan in his power. We are to battle that power even now, in the millennial reign, believing she believes we're in the millennium and that we are reigning with Christ because we've been raised to new life in him. Friends, we cannot hold to that because that throws out the rest of Revelation 1 through 19 completely out of whack. So we, we want to follow common sense translation here. The last verse for tonight is verse 6, so please look at it with me. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. The second death is a reference to the great white throne judgment and being cast into the lake of fire. They shall reign with him a thousand years is reference to brings us a great question that some of you may have even now. One thousand years is a long time. What happens to those that enter into the millennial kingdom in their natural bodies? The group is more than likely not large, but there will probably be a small group of living believers that enter the earthly 1,000-year kingdom. Will they die? What about their children? Will they die? Will they be part of the second resurrection at the end of the millennium? So many questions here with the millennial reign. If the natural bodied of the redeemed die at an old age, Listen, follow with me. If, I'm not saying this happens, if the natural body, meaning a, a, a believer that accepted Christ during the tribulation, that made it through the battle of Armageddon, made it through all of the things, was not martyred, that it'll be a, a remnant. But if they make it through, will they die of old age? Will their... Um, Oh, yes, if their natural body or the redeemed die at an old age, if they die during the millennium, we do not see their resurrection anywhere else in Scripture. Because up to this point, they came to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and all of the redeemed are there. So if somebody that is accepted Christ in their natural body that enters into the millennial reign if they die during the millennium, we have no record, we have no account of their bodies, their souls being resurrected at any point. The first resurrection at this point is done. So what I believe would make sense is they will live for that thousand years. All right? But what about their kids? Some suggest that only unbelievers or children of those that endured through the end of the tribulation, die during the millennial reign. All right? These would hold to the first resurrection being complete. Right? So if a child of a believer in the millennial reign, if a child does not accept Christ and dies, then they could still be part of the second resurrection. All right? This group would also suggest that the believers die at a certain age. Now, Isaiah 65, 20, the unbelievers die. I, don't, I hope I said that right. The unbelievers die at a certain age. Isaiah 65, 20 uh, kind of uh, points at that, uh, that they would be involved in the second resurrection before the great white throne judgment. The, here's my take, all right? Do the kids die? Do they die at 100? Uh, all of these things, all these questions. Here it is, ready? I don't know. I really don't. And, and I'll go a step farther. It is dangerous to make claims and arguments on what isn't there. I'll simply trust that God has it planned out. Now we can speculate. We can say, well, if the first resurrection is done, then uh, obviously no, no believing uh, physical bodied individual will die because they, there's no resurrection for them later on. We can make assumptions like that, but again, it's not there. So we, we, we cannot, and it's very dangerous to make assumptions. So, 
I will simply trust that God's got it planned out. And uh, I hope and pray that the Holy Spirit has helped us understand the first and the second resurrection. It is a point of uh, conversation. Some, even in the theological sense, we could say it's a point of contention. Uh, who is involved? What, how many are there? Where, when is it? Um, I actually have a chart, and I'm going to print it out for you. I, I, I'm sorry I didn't get to it this week, but I have a chart, and I'm going to print it for you. It's the list of the deaths and the resurrections. So it goes through the, the, uh, the event of being born again. The, that's a birth and death and, and resurrection is part of that list. The, the, the born again, the believer, yes, the first physical, uh, there's a first a physical birth, but then that second birth is spiritual. But then the first death is for both unbelievers and believers. The first death, we all, he says it is appointed on a man once to die. He doesn't delineate and say uh, believers won't and unbelievers will. No, he says it is appointed on a man once to die. And so we know that the first death is for all, for all. But the first resurrection is for the believers. The second resurrection is for the unbelievers. And the second death is for unbelievers as well. And he says, blessed are those that are, are a part of the first resurrection. And those that are among the second resurrection will be thrown into the lake of fire. We're going to look at chapter 20, uh, starting in verse 7 this next week, Lord willing, all right? I pray that you, you learn. I pray that your, your knowledge will affect your heart for the Lord, that you would want to dig in deeper. Uh, I encourage you, get, get a book on this. Get some, uh, if you want some good uh, information on it, uh, I'd love to talk about that with you so that we can really understand the, the book because we want to be people of the book, amen? I want, to be a, I want to be a man that knows this book. Uh, and I want, to know, uh, I want to know the God of this book uh, and that he would give us the wisdom to understand his writing. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and we will be dismissed here tonight. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for revelation, for the things to come. Lord, I thank you that we are a part of that first resurrection if we've accepted you as our Savior. Lord, we thank you for being part of the family of God. And whenever that resurrection of the believing souls is, whatever, uh, whatever aspect of it that we are involved in, Lord, we thank you for that. What a blessing that is. Lord, we thank you that we will reign with you. Lord, we don't know how that's going to look, but Lord, we know that any time with you, reigning with you, worshiping you, walking this earth with you, in whatever sense it is you have for us, Lord, it will be a glorious glorious thing. Lord, we thank you. And Lord, I pray that we would seek the lost the way that you seek the lost. We would love lost souls the way that you love the world. And Lord, that we would, uh, we would change the, uh, help change the eternal fate of as many as we can so that they would, too would be part of that first resurrection and glorified bodies living with their heavenly Father. Lord, I pray that your that you would come quickly, Lord, that you would break our hearts for the things of God while we wait, that you would bring us revival, that we would be a people of your book, a people that seek you day in and day out. And Lord, I pray that this church family, this church body here, that we would be a shining light to our community because we love your word and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and finish this evening with 667 in your hymn book, 667. Would you stand with me as we finish this evening with 667, who is on the Lord's side? Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be his helpers other lives to bring? Who will heed the world's side? Who will face the foe? Who is on the Lord's side? Who for him will go? 
by thy call of mercy, by thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side, Savior, we are thine. Amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you back here on Wednesday.